So we'll give people another minute or two and then we'll crack on because I've got quite a bit to get through and um, <clears throat> I don't know where you all are in the world, but um, I don't know whether you're just waking up or whether you're just about to go home. But um, just a minute or two and we'll see how we go. So I hope you're all comfortable with this interface and um, that I'll share my screen with you now. Even that. So hopefully you can see my screen there and the beginning of the PowerPoint presentation. I'm basically going to mix, jump between PowerPoint and the software so I'll be uh, showing you stuff as we go along in addition to explaining stuff through um, through the PowerPoint presentation, so hopefully, hopefully you'll go away with um, a reasonable amount of information today, and then I hope you'll also join me in a week's time when I'll go into things in, in quite a bit more detail as well. Okay, I see two minutes after three, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to get going. Okay, so let me make that go away. Let me maximize. And let me first of all welcome you to our webinar today, and thank you very much indeed for taking the time to, to join with us. This is part of a two uh, the, there's two in this series of webinars, the first today obviously and the second in a week's time exactly. And uh, today is designed to be something of a, a bit of a, an overview if you like of, of uh, what we do in the way of QNMR. And what I'll show you in a week's time is, is I'll go into a lot more detail as to um, how things work when you, um, you know, really get, get your arm sleeves rolled up and, and get stuck in. So hopefully what you'll see today will be something that will um, entice you to want to use this and uh, hopefully it will also do that by showing you that A, the information you get is, is, is powerful and easily achieved and uh, that it's robust. Something I'll be addressing in a week's time as well will be aspects of automation too. So everything I'm showing you today is through the user interface but um, there's absolutely no reason why none of this can't be done under full automation or t at the same time that you do verification or something of that nature. Okay, so let's have a look now. So this is the first part today and we're going to be looking at how, how, how the process works for quantification. We're going to, something that I get asked a lot is um, how, do we, how do you or we choose the best way to determine the area of the peaks because clearly that's going to be at the heart of what you get in the way of results. We'll look at some analyses because I want to show you um, basically what, what's available in, in, without too much detail. And then I'll, I'll show you an example of purity determination and then I'll show you some aspects of the user interface that, that you can um, modify when you're using it interactively. So how does it work? So the first thing we need to do obviously is to have a spectrum that's correctly acquired and so uh, that aspect of correct, when I say correctly acquired, it's, um, it's, there's quite a lot to that really, there can be quite a lot to that and um, if you're new to QNMR then you really need to go away and do a little bit of reading as to um, what, what you need to do for your spectrum to be, um, to, to give correct results. Um, so I can point you as well to some articles that I've written that you can download and, and well, read on our uh, software post. So if you go to themestrolab.com slash blog, you'll see there um, what a heading under QNMR and under QNMR I've written a bunch of articles there which talk about the way in which to correctly make up your compounds and correctly measure the NMR spectra and so on and so forth. And you, you do need to get this right, otherwise you know, it doesn't matter how good our software is, it, it, it doesn't stand a chance of, of um, giving you a correct answer. And you know, you always will get an answer and, and, it, and the problem is that 
you may think that the answer is correct, but um, so you, you do have to be, you know, you do have to worry about that. Make sure you get it right in the spectrometer. Okay, back to the presentation. <clears throat> so, once we have the spectrum acquired, um, we then need to worry about a few processing aspects, for example, window functions, with the, what you're going to use there, uh, making sure that the phase is correct, and sometimes you do need to worry about baseline as well. These fa the Sorry, Mike. Which these factors are really... Mike, we, we can't see your screen. You need to click on the play button. Sorry. Ah, can, can you see it now? Yeah, perfectly. Thanks. Ah, oh, whoops. Have you not seen anything that I've done? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't feel shy to, to chime up. Okay, so I showed you a second ago just a picture of the, the websites where you can get some information about how to acquire and acquire the data and make up the samples correctly. And I'm beginning to delve into some detail now about the way you process the data. The, whether, whether these factors, the window function, the phase and the baseline, whether these are really important depends a bit on the way in which you go to integrate your spectrum. So this is, for example, phase and baseline are less of a, a worry if you're doing GSD integration, which I'll speak about in a second. So processing the spectrum is important because uh, the things like wiggles and aspects of um, instrument artifacts can uh, do nasty things to, to the answers, potentially. The next thing that you have to do with the software is to determine the number of mul determine the multiplets in the spectrum and the number of nuclei, number of nuclides for each multiplet. Okay, NN is number of nuclides. And there are a couple of ways to do that. The easiest the easiest way is just to do auto multiplets, which is this, uh, which is a single command over here. And it, just, I would recommend that if you can provide the chemical structure to the software, then it does make this process a little bit more robust. So uh, try and do that if you can. It's not a requirement though. If you have the prediction software, prediction capability as well, then you can use auto assignments and use the auto assigned spectrum as the input to quantification. But again, that's not a requirement, but it's nice if you have it and it, and it further leverages your investment in, in, in the prediction software. Hmm. Right, why is my screen frozen now? Oh, 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 bloody. One sec. It's no presentation, blah, a few technical difficulties. Okay, I don't seem to be able to run this at full view, so I'm just going to leave it like that. Right. So, uh, we spoke about the processing. Now, what you have to do once you've got your multiples designed and, and determined, let's say this is all nicely. Um, automated. You then launch the QNMR, one of two QNMR modules, and we've got them separated for good reason, but there's, in principle, there's not, not, not a, a huge gap between them. So whether you're determining concentration or purity-like properties of your solution or your compound, um, you'll launch one of those. And um, what we then do for you automatically is to rank the multiplets as to their suitability to be used to determine the, the QNMR, the, the concentration. So what, what this is trying to do, in fact, is to find multiplets that are, are, are clearly clean in the sense that they only have intensity coming from the molecule and they don't have additional intensity coming from some impurity or some other bits of rubbish. and um, I won't be get, saying a huge amount about this today, but uh, I, I'll show you roughly how that works. This is something that only needs really to be set up once. So once you have it done, then you can kind of leave it. But at the beginning, you do have to kind of worry about it a little bit and 
um, maybe speak to me or someone if you if you're having difficulty. So what the software then does is to then look at look at the top ranked multiplets in the compound spectrum, and it determines the pram the QNMR parameter that that you want to work out, you know, whether it's concentration or whatever, for each of those multiplets, and then it works out the average for those and the RMSD percentage for those, and then it does a bit of reporting at the end. And that, that's it really. You, 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 if you're working through the UI, you can in fact override these things. So if, if it's chosen particular multiplets and you don't agree with that, then you can change that without difficulty. So uh, let's look at some spectrum preparation now. This is um, pretty easy stuff, I think, I hope. So I've got a spectrum of philodipine. This molecule here, to market a drug, and it's been nicely acquired. You can see that the signal to noise is extremely good, which is um, a good requirement for um, high quality quantification. There's an additional peak here, this one at um, 8.7 or so, which arises from the purity standard, which is not too important at this point in time. Let's worry about preparing the spectrum. So the first thing I'm going to do is that although the phase looks pretty decent, it's not that great over here. Um, if I zoom in on the peak here, you'll see there's some additional wiggles and rubbish around there that I'd like to get rid of. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a little bit of, um, of a weighting function. So if I go to appetization, uh, the two that you can consider doing are exponential multiplication, and there's a second one that we make more difficult to find, and it's this Hanning one. So you could uh, use that one, either or. I, I'd say use the exponential one and keep your life simple for now. So let's apply that. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to do is the phase isn't quite as good as I'd like it to be. It's quite good, but it's not perfect. And I'm going to be pretty fussy about this sort of thing today because that's the way it has to be. So go to the normal phasing window and oops, press up, I'm pressing the control key as I'm moving the mouse. So I get fine adjustment. So it's correctly phased where the blue line is now. And I'm going to use the right mouse button now to phase away from that, and so that's better now. I'm happy with that. So I'll get away. I'll dismiss the phase correction window here. Right, so I'm happy with the phase, the weighting, and the last thing is basically to do a baseline correction. So my personal favorite is the Bernstein polynomial with order three, and I find that to be pretty bulletproof. Um, just a word, word of caution, if you're working with proton spectra, I'd advise against using the Whittaker smoother, can get you into trouble. So that, let's just stick with the stuff that, that, that we know works well. So we use the Bernstein polynomial, that's done its work. This spectrum is now ready for analysis. And as I say, we can do it in one of two ways. We can either ask it to do auto assignments, so if you have, as I say, if you have the NMR predict software, then you have this available, auto assignments, and if you don't, then you have automatic multiplets available. So let's click on that and see what it does. It's not a particularly challenging molecule other than search so and have difficulty with that. So it's done quite a lot of work here. Um, it's gone in and it's identified the solvent, the residual water, there's all the carbon-13 satellites and uh, bits of impurity will have been um, found and, and indicated. So you can see here there's some little impurities that are labeled as green peaks and those are actually satellites that come from the carbon on this ring here, sorry on the tetra tetrachloronitrobenzene, TCNB, this is the TCNB peak. So those are actually real peaks as it happens. And it's gone through and it's found all the multiplets. 
to the spectrum and it's also assigned the number of nuclides to each of them. So for this metal triplet, it's 19 there. It's, it's telling me that there's three protons assigned to that. And this is what it's going to use. Um, the, the, these number of nuclides here are really quite important. So that's really the long and short of it in terms of, of processing. Let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to talk about integrals now a little bit. Um, we have essentially three options we can use here. We can use, first of all, let's consider using sum integrals, which are, which is just the basic integration method that, that all software uses. It's just adding up the numbers, really. And this can be uh, this can be the most reliable at times. Uh, we've got ways to make sure that you've got a wide enough integral region. You'll see that in the options. And uh, in, in simple cases, as, as you saw in the spectrum a minute ago, where uh, everything is nicely separated, it, this, this can be the best way to do it. Uh, that, you know, it's tried and tested. There uh, really aren't any possible complications. The only complications that arise are when you've got multiplets that are quite close to one another and um, that's going to make and, and that, that's going to restrict your integral windows and such. So it's well behaved and it's um, and, and, and it, it, it's a good one to try and go for if you get looking for the best results. Now there's times when um, You've got a lot of overlap, and I'll show you examples of this in a second, so it's not just dry. Um, there's times when you've got a lot of overlap, and in those cases, you do want to use uh, global spectrum deconvolution, this GSD, and the GSD will take care of things like overla overlap um, of peaks, um, and it provides peak IDs, and um, it, it's, it's quite a good technique. Uh, there's, there's things that can fool it in the case where you're looking for the ultimate in, in accuracy and precision then that you, you do need to sort of consider certain things and I'll try and show you some examples of that. Finally, you can go for total line shape, fit, line shape fitting so you can, well, that's actually a two-step procedure where you first, the software first does GSD integrals to or GSD peak picking to identify the peaks and then it does line shape fitting. And this is the conventional line shape fitting. So this assumes that your peak is um, nice and symmetrical. It assumes that it's a mixture of Lorentzian and Gaussian. And there are things that, that can go wrong with it. I mean, it sort of sounds like, well, how could it possibly go wrong? But so if, you, you know, if you have any shimming artifacts or you have any asymmetry in the peaks, and that, that won't be modeled correctly. So the, the, there are times where line shape is, is not the best option, really. And, and I'd say that's the case for when you're not sure about the quality of your spectrum. So again, let's go and take a look at some spectra, spectral data. So, Here's one I prepared earlier. So a, quite a complicated spectrum, reasonably complicated really. Um, clearly if you wanted to do a lot of integration in the aromatic region, you wouldn't be able to use some integrals because you wouldn't be able to easily set nice integral regions through here and make sure that you catch all the peaks. So if we do GSD peak picking, So if I look at the GSD op the options, or the peak picking options, I should say, this is set to GSD as opposed to standard now. Standard is the same as sum. And you, you do have some control over how hard you're going to make GSD work. So if you're going for the ultimate and, and things working really well, you do, you do want to set the resolution. Normally, the defaults would be normal resolution and two fitting cycles, and it would go through the spectrum and less than a second probably. But for this purpose, I'd say bump up the resolution a little bit, which means it's going to try a little bit harder and give it an extra couple of fitting cycles. Let's do that. And now when we do the, the peak picking analysis, it's going to go through the entire spectrum and find all the peaks in there and their areas and their positions and their half heights and all the information 
pertaining to each peak. So there we go. Um, so now when we look at this region here, we can see there's actually quite a bit that's that's picked out. And if we uh, were going in and, and looking at summing, looking at this, this multiplet here, for example, um, you can see that there's quite a few peaks there. I, I can display them as well, but um, that, that will just take a bit of time. So the GSDs work quite well here, and everything looks okay. That's all fine. Clearly, if this was, if you weren't doing GSD integration, then this region would be kind of out of bounds. And in cases where you have peaks that are very close to either the residual water, which is not illustrated in this case, but if that were the case, then you could still reliably integrate that. Or if you had a peak that was very close to the DMSO signal, then again you could, um, I beg your pardon, the methanol signal here, then you could uh, again reliably integrate that. And in fact some quantification methods actually rely on the integral of, of the residual solvent itself. So if that were the case, then what this is saying is that um, because we have these peaks classified, we were able to work out the integral of the residual solvent, which is good news. So that's GSD. And the auto, sorry, the, the, I, I, I won't speak a lot about um, line fitting, because that's done automatically. But you can see that, for example, if you applied line fitting to this peak here, you've got you've got some stuff on the right on the low field end here, which are which looks a bit I don't know whether that's impurity or what whether that shimming, but that maybe it's impurity, and that would clearly challenge any line fitting. I suspect that this peak is a bit asymmetrical. It looks asymmetrical on the right on the upfield side here, the right side. So again, line fitting may struggle to, to get a really accurate number out of out of this particular spectrum. However, if you have something that's pretty simple like this, this acetanolide, then, then things are really quite are quite simple. And if we do peak picking on this, this is GSD peak picking again, I just want to illustrate one little point here. Okay, so the point I really wanted to make here was that if you, even though this is as simple a spectrum as this, the, the coupling patterns in these AA prime, BB prime type systems are, are actually quite complex, and so you don't get nice triplets, you don't actually have nice triplets here. And so GSD then has to make its mind up as to whether this shoulder here, for example, is an impurity or whether it's actually part of this multiplet, and it can get some of these wrong. So. Um, it's not actually GSD that's doing this, it's, it's what's called auto-classify at the end of it. But in point of fact, it was, this multiplet would be under-integrated by GSD because it would not use these peaks over here. So this is a, a good case where conventional sum integration would be um, the way to go because A, there's, there's hidden complexity in these deceptively simple multiplets. And B, uh, we've got quite a lot of, of white, white uh, noise between each multiplet, so we've got, we're able to set nice wide um, integral limits. Okay, well, I hope that's helped a little bit in terms of um, demystifying this whole aspect of which integration method shall I use. So we've looked at integration methods, so let's crack on. And I do need to make this. Uh, what I'm showing in this slide uh, is the basic functionality that's available through QNMR. So what, what can we do using the QNMR module? Well, the first thing is to determine concentration. So I've got a spectrum here of, of sucrose, which is made up at something close to 50 millimolar. And I've gone through the, 
the QNMR concentration procedure, and it's come up and written the results here as a little report on the spectrum. And it tells me which particular multiplets were used to derive that number, and what the signal-to-noise ratio was for each of them, and what concentration was obtained for each. So that, that's, that's one aspect. The second aspect is, is what I showed you a second ago, which is purity. So here we have philodipine that's co-dissolved with the purity reference material, which in this case is tetrachloronitrobenzene, which provides this peak here, which is labeled C. And given the fact that I know the purity of, of the TCMB and I know the masses of, of both materials before they were dissolved in the DMSO, um, it's a fairly easy matter to, to go through and, and work out what the purity of this material is. So that's what it's done. It's used these particular multiplets. Notice now that they, the multiplets are actually assigned, and that's because I've used auto-assignment in this instance. And the report shows, um, I don't know whether you can see this, but uh, it shows that the average purity is 99.8% with a small RMSD. And then below that, it's listing the, the data that was used to, as, as an input to, to that determination. So purity is used a lot in certain circles, and um, it might be useful to you too if you're working just straight with organic chemistry. It's really quite, um, quite a powerful method, purity by NMR. Um, certainly the folks in, in pharmaceutical development use it all day, every day. Something that can be used, can be important, so is determining a salt ratio. So we've got a potentially basic compound here, and we want to, and we know that it's a fumarate salt that was um, prepared as such. Uh, but it can, it can be quite difficult to know what the actual salt ratio is. You know, what, what what is the stoichiometry of of base to fumarate? So. It, you look at it and say, well, it must be one-to-one, -one, but it doesn't always work that way. It can be less than one-to-one. -one. That's not unreasonable at all. So what we do in this instance is to basically look at the area of the fumarate peak, which is this one here at 6.7, and we compare that with areas of peaks from, from the compound, and we come up with a salt ratio average, which is a percentage in this case. So it's, it's saying that it's one-to-one -one basically in this instance as it happens. And again, we have a bit of information there as to which peaks we use to determine that. And lastly, we've got uh, some capability to, to determine the, the amount of solvent, residual solvent that's in the spectrum. So here I have a spectrum of brucine that's been contaminated with some ethyl acetate. So the ethyl acetate produces the peaks that are shown with the uh, three arrows, um, and what I've asked the software to do is to go through and tell me what the mole percentage of, of ethyl acetate is, and it's shown in this little report here, and it's, that's the number there. Now, you're going to have to take my word for the fact that these numbers are right, and uh, um, obviously we've done lots of checking ourselves, but uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong at all in, in, in making up standard solutions and convincing yourself that these things are working correctly. Yeah. So those are the four main categories of usage of QNMR within the software at this moment in time. So the one thing that, that we're not doing at this point in time is looking at complex mixtures of, of materials. So the spectrum that you see at the moment, which the ethyl acetate brucine spectrum, is about as close as we get to a mixture spectrum. So uh, this is something that obviously we will be working on, and it's we consider it very important, and we will we, we will address it. But in its current form, the software doesn't really address that. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into purity determination as a, as an example now. So what we have here, as I say, is a co-dissolved analyte and a QNMR certified standard. These have to be weighed accurately. Sorry, that should be weighed accurately. Um, these certified standards um, get from various places. Sigma Aldrich um, make a, um, provide a, quite a wide variety of these uh, designed for NMR usage. And if you look up QNMR certified standard on the 
Sigma site, you'll, you'll see various of these, their solubilities and so on and so forth, and this is a good place to start if, you, if you're new to, new to this game. Um, as I mentioned, we've also got on our software posting, we've got articles that relate to how to do this, how to do this, how to make up these solutions correctly. So basically you take your material, you dissolve, you weigh that quite accurately, you then co-dissolve that with an amount of one of these materials that that you've also weighed very accurately, and then you add an arbitrary amount of solvent, it's not important. And the instrumental parameters are not terribly important in this particular experiment. So let's go through the example. As I say, we're looking at philodipine, which is a molecule on the left, and we're looking at using TCNB, which is this material here on the right, as our quantification reference. So TCNB is an eternal QNMR reference standard. Okay, so we're going to go through this. I'm going to be talking about library usage, integration, multiple selection, and reporting. And here we go. Let's pull up the spectrum. Uh, first one, yeah. Okay, so we've already done the preparation for this, so that's, uh, that's great. That saved us a bit of time. So we've made sure that the phase is great, baseline's good. We've done the multiple determination and the number of nucleons for multiple has been done. And we're all set to go, really. So what we have to do is to go to advanced, QNMR, and purity. And well, the last time I used this, I was actually looking for a solvent, so I need to make that go away. But you'll see there's three tabs on the top here, purity, counter ion, and solvent. Uh, these are the three functionalities that, that you can access through this particular interface. So we, we need to worry about purity. And what you have to do is to choose from this drop-down box your particular internal reference. Um, you're all thinking, how does that box get populated with relevant information? I'll show you that in a second. But TCNB is what I, I need to select, that's what I'm using. And internally it knows where the TCNB um, occurs, it, no, it knows what the molecular weight of TCNB is. Just one sec. Okay, I don't think that's relevant. Okay, um, and that's required for the analysis. So with that information, what we need to do is to provide it with the molecular weight or molecular mass of the compound. Uh, because the compound's in the window, I can actually click on molecular mass, molecular weight there, and it'll calculate it for me. And these numbers here are the numbers that you wrote down in, in your lab notebook when you went to the weighing station. Just one sec, please. Right, so all I have to do now is click Calculate, and it's going to go away and work out, work things out for me. So it's gone through, and it's, if there were any things to worry about, it would tell me about them in this alert window. So I'm going to clear these, because these are from previous bits of work I did earlier today. Uh, so any sort of gross errors will be shown in the alert window there. And what this is telling me is that it's worked out that the purity average is this 99.4% number with that small RMSD, and it's used multiplets D, F, and G, as it happens, D, F, and G. To work, to work that number out. And if I click Paste Report, it's going to pop that on the page. And that's essentially what I've shown you uh, previously. It, it's it's the standard uh, way in which to work these. If, if you sit there and you think, well, I don't particularly like using DNF, I'd rather use um, K, the, the 
the fact that this is grayed is telling me that it's used that as the TC, it's identified that as the TCMB. So if you say actually I want to use K, you could click on that and you could recalculate things. So now it's using that. And then if you said, well actually I don't want to use F for some reason, you can deselect that. If it had the number of new clients wrong, so the H is here, if you need to change that, you can modify that in the window here. So it's a bit, bit that you can do in here if you need to, but most times hopefully it'll be about right. And the reason that we try very hard to get it right first time is that if you don't do that, then you're never going to be able to apply automation to this. Okay, so that's, uh, that's great. That's worked fine. Um, what I want to do now is to just spend a small amount of time on the settings because the settings, it, it, the problem with going through a lot of detail on settings is that it, it, it can make you think that the software is really tough to use and it's not. What I hope I've done is to show you just, just by clicking calculate here and paste report, things pretty well get calculated correctly. But you do have to set things up at some point in time and that's done through this window here. So we have a library here of, on, on this first tab I have the word reference and from here I can look at various things, solvent references, counterlines and whatever. And this is the place where you would um, add a new reference. So if for example you happen to use malic acid as your, as your concentration reference then you would click on reference, you'd put some numbers in here and the number of nuclides, some information here on the molecular weight and the purity of that particular reference material, give it some names and you'd add it. So um, let's do a bogus one. So if I do my stuff and here I do stuff and we'll uh, keep it in DMSO. The molecular weight happens to be 100.0 and the purity happens to be 99.999. So this is a reference material and it's got a peak let's say at somewhere between 3.0 and 3.05. I'm just picking numbers out of the air and that corresponds to two new clients. So now when I click on the plus button, that's going to get added into the table here. You see it, stuff, my stuff, all that stuff. And if I want that to persist, if I want that to come up next time, I have to save it away with the other thing. So here you see save library. I click on that and it'll get pushed into where I keep my library. Okay, I'm not going to save it, but here we go. And now, if I click on OK, ah, I do have to save it as it happens. Right, let's save it. So now, you see my stuff is available in the pull-down menu. Yeah, it's become available. So that's how you manipulate that. that um, library of compounds. If I want to get rid of it, I can select my stuff and I can delete it and I can save this. And it's gone now. Okay. So, um, we spoke about integration methods. Uh, in this case, I used a sum integration. Multiplication factor determines the effective window, integral window. So it'll be 12 times the, the, the line width of the outer peaks. How detailed we want to report and where we want the report to go is, is selected on over here. So I want to paste it to MNOVA. You can save it to a file, push it to the clipboard. And this window is a little bit more complicated because it's the one that you need to do, you need to do when, you need to consider when you're choosing your particular um, multiplet 
selection rules. So you can either select multiplets on the basis of a minimum RMSD, so choosing the small RMS, smallest RMSD, or using these scoring rules here. I'm not going to go into detail today. Um, I'll go into more detail in a week. Or you can do some of these methods. So the, these ranking rules, if you like, are described in one of the articles if you want to go and read about them. And that's all I'm going to say about them today, because otherwise it makes things look too complicated. OK, so let's go back to the presentation. And I'm going to try and steam ahead now. And I think I'm pretty much done. So um, I hope that I've convinced you and shown you that what we've got here is a, a versatile and reliable tool that's easy to use. And I'm, I haven't got lots and lots of conclusions here. And I hope that the, the words and the looking at the spectrum themselves have really spoken for themselves and that you, that you agree with those statements. And I invite you to join in on the second part of this webinar in a week's time where I'll be focusing on concentration determination and I'll be talking about automation options. So with that, I'll thank you very much indeed for your uh, time today. And I'm going to take a look at the window here and see if, um, if there are any questions here that, that need to be addressed. So what we've got here. Danny, is there anything? Any questions, guys? I don't see any question yet, Mike, but let's wait a few minutes. OK. Okay, guys, I'm, I'm assuming that, that I've been really, really clear in what I've said because I don't see any questions. So I'm going to put a positive spin on it that way, and I'm going to thank you again very much indeed for giving me your time today, and I hope you've been convinced that what you've seen is, is useful and that you can use it in your, in your research. And if you have further inquiries, then um, you can send an email to... Um, sales at mesterlab.com or to me, mike at mesterlab.com and uh, let's talk about your QNMR needs, okay? So with that, um, I'm going to sign off and again, thank you for your time and wish you a pleasant day. Bye-bye now.